thank you for the introduction and thank you for the presentation. I'm um, bringing here a topic which is on data-driven predictive maintenance. So how many of you have heard about predictive maintenance? Few, okay. So I want to talk about what kind of challenges and opportunities this task places to machine learning and to data science. Um, so basically we want to come from this setting, which it's currently most of the settings, if we consider public transportation, to this setting here. So we want to predict when some asset, some equipment is going to fail. Okay? Why? Well, of course, you can understand in terms of costs and efficiency, it's important to keep the asset or the equipment functioning for as most time as you can get and also get some reliability on the, their functioning. So there are some key points to consider when we want to define these maintenance strategies. So first of all, should the maintenance be scheduled and should the actions be reactive or proactive? We can have at present time these two types of maintenance strategies. One is just reactive and the other one is just proactive. But let's see how much reactive and proactive do, which, how much trade-off do they represent in fact? Why? Because for them to be effective, I cannot have too much proactive maintenance. And probably you can guess why. Because if I'm always in maintenance, that has costs, right? But also I don't have, I don't would like to fall into the reactive case because that means that the failure actually happened. So I have some impact on my equipment. So how can I assess these possible savings and costs that is a difficult question to answer and varies from domain to domain. And, but basically what I'm saying is regarding the, the cost and the amount of the predictive preventive maintenance, you would achieve something like this. So if you do a lot of preventive maintenance, you would get a higher cost. On the contrary, if you do not make any preventive uh, maintenance, you also incur into serious costs of having to repair the equipment so it keeps functioning. So the idea is to find that optimal uh, threshold or optimal maintenance zone, zone. And that leads us to, once you enter the field, and if you want to enter the field of predictive maintenance, you will get to this curve, which is called the PF curve. So first of all, one of the, well, definitions on predictive maintenance is this one that I put here. So it's a set of techniques designed to determine the condition of the equipment and estimate when should the maintenance take place. So you would see this PF curve as the following. So you have on one X the asset or the equipment condition, and on the other one you have time. And since the original design of the equipment until the installation of the asset and uh, until it fails or it, until it has its end of life, because it has, you will see a pattern such as this one, okay? So the asset condition will degrade as time evolves. The key question here for predictive maintenance is this PF interval, which is basically the point at which the failure starts to evolve until it really leads to what we call cat catastrophic failure. That means that it's no longer working. So we want to act upon this interval. And I will go through you with uh, some of the standards on this PF curve so that we are all clear where do we stand. So corrective maintenance or run to failure is what we have once our car breaks down in the street, right? So we have to stop uh, what we were doing. We don't know how much time we are going to be stopped. And you can imagine this on uh, an industry. So what uh, affects 
We have to pay for the maintenance, which will be expensive. And the way that it's uh, corrected, it depends a lot on the expertise of the technician. Okay, So we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost. Then if we are going a little bit up, we have what we call preventive maintenance which if you consider many public transportation uh, areas, it's the scheduled or the standard use for doing the maintenance. So each of us with a car go to this preventive maintenance, right? Every year, just to check the, the, some of the things related to the car. And that can be okay. And that can be based on some historical failure data that the experts have. So you should check the oil once in, I don't know, how many months. But, and with that, we are trying to avoid these unexpected uh, downtimes. But it may not be effective to detect or to spot in between failures. So between one of the scheduled uh, visits and the other one, we can have an evolving failure that is not spotted by this standard. Again, a little bit more up, but still with nothing related with artificial intelligence or data science, is what we call condition-based maintenance. So basically, this relies on knowledge from the main experts that establish these decision support systems or rule systems that establish those limits for which we should be or for which an alert should be given once that limit is breached. So we get these also in our cars, right? When there is some issues with the motor or the oil or something. So this is only related to rules and rule-based um, maintenance, okay? Now we get to the point that we really want to address here, which is predictive maintenance which basically has to do with being continuously monitoring the data um, so that we can apply machine learning methods uh, to try to extract patterns from that data and give an alert whenever some potential failure is starting to evolve. So that is the main goal of predictive maintenance. Okay. So the idea is to avoid those unexpected um, downtimes. So it will imply that we use, of course, data and ideally some domain knowledge. But I will get into that into um, a bit. There are already, this is not uh, new, you can imagine there are already some predictive maintenance strategies in action. One of them is on aircrafts, because um, you know that aircrafts are very <laughs> critical equipment, so they pretty much sensorize everything. So, but we have things like this airplane, which generates more than 20 terabytes of data in a single flight. They sensorize everything, many things. So they have really high quality data. They rely on very high quality data and very well known failures to spot these uh, predictive maintenance strategies in the best way as possible, or at least the ones that they think that it's the best way. And so far, it's not so bad, okay? On the other hand, we have very simple equipment, which the, the, the functioning is very well described by a physical model. And in this case, we have things like wheel bearings from which the physics explains by gathering one single sensor, which is the vibration sensor, gets to identify the three possible defaults that they can happen. So once it's, very, very, once it's defined, you just have to gather all the data and see when that failure is occurring. So here the trick would be very well understood failures. 
So, but we have a whole set of uh, complexity within this tool. So we cannot sensorize everything, right? We don't have that uh, money to spend on sensorizing everything. And on the other hand, we cannot, maybe in many domains, we cannot describe every possible failure. So we are in between the two and uh, predictive maintenance tries to somehow bind or bridge the gap between the two, but of course, depending on the domain. We can see things like the public transportation, as, a, as I have mentioned, smart manufacturing, more evolved uh, medical equipment. We can go to the heating systems, for instance, in the northern countries, they do a lot of predictive maintenance on the heating system for the cities. And as you can imagine, this involves a lot of different aspects regarding the type of failures, which are particular for each type of problem, what sensors, how many data, which volume. So we have all set of um, big difference between all these problems. But let's imagine now that we have what we call data-driven predictive maintenance tasks. So basically we gather this data that we think that it will be useful for spotting the failures. And the goal is to provide that data to an AI system that will then notice the human stakeholder, uh, notify them about the failure. We have two types of notifications. One is regarding diagnostics and the other one is prognostics. So you can imagine present and future. And diagnostics is related to tasks such as anomaly detection, fault detection, root cause analysis. So these are three standard machine learning tasks that are handled by machine learning and they respond what happened, okay? And uh, the root cause analysis tries to respond why it happened. Regarding prognostics, we are trying to predict in the future when it will happen. And for that, we can address a task of remaining useful life. And in the ultimate um, level, we would like to have what we call prescriptive maintenance is when and what should I do about it to mitigate it. So a lot of tasks are implied here. What are the challenges? Well, first of all, we have a lot of sources, different sources that must be really well integrated so that we can extract knowledge. We can have source data, uh, se sorry, sensors data, logs data, maintenance um, reports, and we know that there are failures in this kind of uh, quality in this data, okay? G regarding all the three sources. The other stuff is that this, what we are trying to predict, is really what is rare. And that presents a known problem for machine learning. We need to learn from few examples. We should have very few from uh, the data which is the normal condition of the equipment. Then we also have this type of challenges. Some of them are not failures, are just an atypical use of the, of the equipment. So we can, I put that, that image because we do, we, that happens a lot with the train doors and it's an abnormal movement of the door, but it's not a failure. And sometimes, you have the equipment, the same one, operating at different settings. Very low temperatures or very high temperatures affect the functioning of the equipment that is known for the, the, the experts. So some of these might mask or even be mixed with fault systems. So we don't really know until we check it. And the last challenge, it's related to these complex systems are not so independent from each other. You can imagine that all these systems are connected in a big complex system. And sometimes the failure evolves from one part of the system and it's reflected in another part of the systems. Where it came from, where what's its origin, that may, might also be a big problem to disentangle these effects. So let's now go to the opportunities. So 
we would like to create knowledge, okay? We would like to know why is the fault occurring, what can be done, and that would lead us to some new insights regarding the equipment. And that ultimately lead us to these explainable AI methods. But here, in explainable predictive maintenance, we have to be aware that if we just use standard XI methods, those XI methods are more for debugging the model for data scientists. You will not give some domain expert that, he will not understand how that can help them. So we need to bridge the gap somehow between these domain experts that do the maintenance on the equipment and our XI methods. So we need to match tasks and explanations, and that is still a challenge, okay? Or it's a, an open opportunity, which is performing what we call joint human machine learning. And we want to grab the low level data patterns from the AI system, but also incorporate somehow the high level concepts of the stakeholder. How can we merge them? How can we integrate them in a meaningful way? And this is basically just the start, because you can imagine that if we are able to fulfill these goals, we would be able to understand the real degradation pattern of different components and see how different usage and external conditions affects them and starting to um, get better designs of the equipment, taking into account all this data that is gathered from them functioning in different settings. So that would allow really a better design of the equipment in the future. And this is like what's related with batteries time lives now that uh, they want to predict uh, as accurate as possible. And ultimately, of course, we want to contribute for the reduce of uh, um, amount of waste, this type of electric waste, which is harmful. So ultimately, we would like to explore as much as we can the useful life of an equipment and don't get rid of them just before because we didn't, we weren't able of understanding if that failure was a permanent one or possible to avoid. Okay. So of course, this is a, a work in progress that I have. Um, and this was a, just an overview because in 20 minutes I could not enter too many details, but I'm glad to answer your uh, questions if you want. But this has been going on as a joint work uh, of many people and researchers. Uh, one of two, two main projects were involved on this. The first one was Failstopper, which was actually run with Metro do Porto. They wanted to um, predict or forecast the failures on the APU system uh, of Metro two hours beforehand so that the passengers would not feel the impact of having to leave the train. And the other one, it's XPM, which is involved, it's involving uh, uh, also a team from Sweden and which is handling Volvo buses in the cities. And the other one is from Poland, which is sensorizing a steel manufacturing industry to find these uh, kind of failures. So this project is about to finish, but we are um, proposing a new one because there are many, many issues still to, to address. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, please, I'm free to answer. Can see it. Okay. We have several questions here. Okay. The first one with more votes. Uh, let me see. Sometimes when you make maintenance, the maintenance task can cause the deploy system failures do these actions. Uh, what is the best way to manage this effect? Well, uh, from the data perspective, because I'm not a, an expert on that uh, matter of maintenance, I would say that, of course, when it comes back, 
the data patterns would spot that something is still not right, and that would help to identify that maintenance operation was not effective, or at least cause another one. Okay. Because we are monitoring and gathering the data, so the idea is that would help in that sense. Okay, thank you. How do you handle imbalanced in this task? Well, basically you can have uh, uh, a couple of approaches. Uh, one of them, you can do injection of failures in a simulated environment if you know exactly how these failures are supposed to happen. But it's still very restricted. And one of the things that we can do if we have only two or three failures to learn from is not meaningful for our data science perspective. On that sense, what we can do is to learn the concept of what is normal and then see what is abnormal and check if that abnormality is really a fault or not. Because we have two different tasks. One is anomaly detection. That case of the train door that is stopped at the middle, it's an anomaly, but it's not a fault. So we can modulate this. Let's just take, assume that the machine has been working in its normal condition for this period. That's learned its normal behavior. And everything that is abnormal, we would uh, double check if it's a fault. Okay. What strategies do you have to create business-centric models for predictive maintenance? How do you prove you are better than the current approach people have followed for years? No, so that's the big issue. <laughs> because, you know, to convince someone that uh, our approach is leading to less costs and it's more effective, it's a quite a challenging one. So my experience with Metro do Porto, we do sensorize only two trains. And it was only, and one of them, the sensors came out broken and so forth. So at the end, we had one train. And we were able to spot some failures. There were uh, three failures. We were able to spot two, not with two hours in advance still, but uh, with some time in advance. And it's very hard to explain to a domain expert that our model is trying to, is really uh, detecting an evolving failure. And that is the challenging of these XI methods. Within the, we have to talk with the domain expert and they have to understand us. And we have to incorporate their knowledge as well. Okay. And okay. that is a big challenge. I yeah, think. I think that is very important on this yeah, process. To be effective. Yeah. How to measure the value of something when the goal is that it doesn't happen? The value of something when? When the, the goal is that it doesn't happen. When? Oh, when the failure doesn't uh, yeah, occur. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I guess we have to, uh, if the... Well, we have two scenarios. One of them, we never predict a failure, and that is useless, right? But the other way around, which is always saying that, uh, uh, or saying that in three years' time, it will be a failure. So we'll have a big chance of uh, um, being accurate. The trade-off is that we have this time window for which our predictions are relevant. Okay. And, uh, well, if our... I would say that if our system didn't alarm anything and nothing happened, I think it's a good, uh, a good, um, Indicator. a good, a uh, good thing. If it alarmed, but too late, it's a bad thing. Yes. If it was not early enough, it's kind of okay. So it depends on the domain and what they tell us. Like in Metro Port, they told us it has to be at least two hours. Okay. Uh, otherwise, the passengers have to move out from the train and they will sense these impacts of the failure. So okay. it's hard to 